Hello everyone. In this presentation, we will deconstruct the concept of play and games and explore the role of games in teaching and learning. The universal design for learning framework enables teachers to design learning for diverse learners by providing learners with multiple means of engagement, by taking advantage of learners' interests and by offering appropriate challenges, and by providing learners with multiple means of representation with a variety of ways for acquiring information and knowledge, and by providing learners with multiple means of action and expression with alternatives for demonstrating what they can and what they know and can do. Teachers wishing to reach diverse learners must know how to do all three of these effectively. They should be able to differentiate the curriculum and instruction so that it provides multiple means of engagement, representation, and action and expression. One way to differentiate the curriculum and instruction is by gamifying learning. To make sure we are all on the same page, let's begin by defining what a game is. Uh, in order to do that though, we first need to define play because all games are a subset of play. Salen and Zimmerman define play as free movement within a more rigid structure. For example, kids playing in a sandbox. The sandbox provides the rigid structure. However, there are no rules and goals. Uh, actually, they're left to each kid to decide what they are. By the way, we are not the only ones who play. Even animals play. Play is one of our most normal and basic activities and perhaps our initiation into structured learning. Vygotsky is one of the early developmental theorists that studied the role of play in learning. According to Vygotsky, there is a zone of proximal development and it is the gap between what a learner can do on their own, their zone of current development, and what they are able what what they are unable to do what they cannot do yet and the zone of proximal development is where the learner can do with the help of a more knowledgeable other and what a learner can do with assistance today they will be able to do it by themselves tomorrow in other words learning is an iterative process as a person continues to learn the zone of current development and the zone of proximal development continue to change over time and independent practice is needed to close the loop. Here's another way to visualize the learning process. According to Vygotsky, we are always moving from the zone of current development to the zone of proximal development. So how does this all fit with play? Well, Play creates a zone of proximal development for the child without the more knowledgeable other. The play itself creates a more virtual more knowledgeable other that allows the child to explore and to develop further its zone of current development even in the absence of the more knowledgeable other. In Vygotsky's words, play creates a zone of proximal development for the child. In play, a child always behaves beyond his average age, above his daily behavior. In play, it is as though he were a head taller than himself. Play is an essential component of not just having the child learn, but learn in a way that develops further and further the child's abilities. Now let's talk about games. As I said earlier, games are a subset of play. According to Salen and Zimmerman, a game is a system in which players engage in an artificial conflict defined by rules that results in a quantifiable outcome. Let's take apart this definition by using Monopoly as an example. There are three major elements to every game. Number one, a game is a system that is defined by rules. In, in Monopoly, for example, there's a certain set of rules that we have to follow in order to play the game. 
all players must start from go every time we pass go we collect 200 if we land on go go to jail we must go to jail and so on these set of rules they create a universe that provides meaning to all our actions in the game the the second element of a game is players are engaged in some type of artificial conflict in monopoly for example players are competing with each other to get as much wealth as pa as possible or to go around go again and again without getting broke and this gives us a sense of purpose and that brings us to the third element of every game a game should result in a quantifiable outcome in the case of monopoly the winner is the one with the most wealth just a side note i just heard that hasbro the the company that markets monopoly is coming up with a cheaters edition of monopoly in this edition players get rewarded for cheating hmm. i don't know if that is a skill set we want to see in our students now we can use this definition in education as well games as systems defined by rules we can say that content areas and subject areas in education are also systems defined by rules so we can map what is happening in a game to what we want to happen uh, in those content and subject areas similarly games result in a quantifiable outcome in education we can use this quantifiable outcome as assessment then we have engage in an artificial conflict now people have trouble with this because they think of conflict in negative terms but if we think about harnessing the competitive instincts in our students usefully and productively then games put boundaries on how that competition plays out in other words we can harness the competitive instinct in a way that is constructive not destructive also the competition does not ne necessarily have to be between players it can be between the player and the game world teachers can also use this to have students collaborate with each other to overcome the challenge set up by the game world and such a type of com competition motivates students and provides an immediate sense of purpose to their learning so we can clearly see that games have a huge potential in teaching and learning. This is especially true for today's students who are gamers and like to learn using strategies, practice, and do-overs. Teachers can help today's students learn more effectively by gamifying their classroom. Uh, games in the classroom facilitate a constructivist model of education by engaging students in an immersive environment that motivates them and provides them with an immediate sense of purpose. Concepts such as student-centered teaching, scaffolding, differentiated teaching, mastery learning, hands-on learning, and so on, they can all be facilitated through games. Games reconnect us with one of our natural instincts, and that is to learn through play. Now, today's teachers can integrate the many educational games that are readily available online. Um, we can also repurpose games for learning. For example, here's Jenga with words to help students increase their reading fluency. Students can play a game where they can form sentences using the words that they pulled out. Another example is Immunopoly, <laughs> a Monopoly type game repurposed by William Beachley from Hastings College. And just as the point in Monopoly is to get around to go again and again without going broke, in Immunopoly, you try to get around without getting sick or killed. And here's another online game, similar to the popular uh, TV game show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, in which students compete against each other to become a millionaire using their math skills. And there are many other gaming ideas that you can use uh, in your classroom. However, not all games are good. And that's important to keep in mind. And not all games will target higher order thinking skills. So here are some important considerations to keep in mind to ensure your game facilitates the learning goals effectively. If you're repurposing a game, 
then use the tape framework to determine if the game is transportable, available, practical, and engaging. Use the SAMR model and the RAT model to determine how your game transforms teaching and learning. And lastly, use the TPAC framework to identify the knowledge and skills a teacher would need to effectively deploy a game in teaching and learning. Thank you for watching and happy gaming everyone.